Hey everyone, this is Nick and I'm pretty sure I'm doing the right thing by recording this video instead of doing my paperwork, like taxes or invoicing sponsors. Yeah, it doesn't matter. What matters is the Linux and open source news. And this week we have Mastodon gaining an enormous amount of users after the acquisition of Twitter by a certain, let's say divisive, billionaire. We also have KDE adding way better tiling features to its window manager called KWIN. And we have scammers using GIMP as a way to distribute malware. And we have today's sponsor that lets you monitor and secure your internet connection. This video is sponsored by Safing. Safing makes the Portmaster an open source tool to take back control of your internet connection. It's free of charge and it lets you see every connection every application makes. And it lets you act on these connections by blocking ads and trackers, malware, not safe for work stuff or scams with auto blocking capabilities and even the ability to use a DNS provider of your choice. You can of course create your own rules globally or per application. Portmaster is available as a DEB or an RPM package, it's in the AUR, or you can also install it on Windows. Using it is free of charge and they have paid tiers starting at 3 euros per month to support the development, or 9.9 euros per month if you want the total package, including the SPN, which is a VPN on steroids that uses a different IP address for every connection, so you're truly impossible to track. So click the link in the description to download the Portmaster. Looks like Twitter's recent acquisition made a lot of people want to try out Mastodon, the decentralized open source alternative. The platform gained almost 200,000 users in the day following the announcement that Elon Musk has completed the purchase of Twitter, bringing the total amount to 600,000 active monthly users. If by any chance you don't know about Mastodon, it's basically Twitter, but built on the Fediverse model. You can create your own instances and these can be federated to be linked to other instances. You can check out posts from people coming from the instance your account lives in, or you can see posts from every other federated instance, which lets you basically stick to communities you want to interact with, a specific hobby or a specific topic, or you can use it just like you would Twitter. The influx of new users apparently strained some servers a bit, notably for one of the main instances, called mastodon.social, but the issue should now be solved. Mastodon is still a lot smaller than Twitter in terms of user numbers, but it offers a very similar experience, with the ability to really stick to topics and communities you like to interact with and without ads. We'll have to wait and see if this influx of new users actually lasts over time or if they just created an account but went back to Twitter altogether. Still, if you want to follow me, I'm on Twitter and I'm on Mastodon, both under at the Linux EXP, and so you can follow me anywhere you like. Looks like Kwin, the KDE window manager, is going to get better at tiling. While you could already just snap windows in place by dragging them to a screen quarter or a screen half, or you could install KWIN scripts like Bismuth to add more capabilities, there will be a more powerful way out of the box that doesn't require you to install anything extra. When moving a window while pressing Shift, the window will be dropped into the nearest tile. You can then resize tiles, which will also resize all other tiled windows. Windows look like they will have some nice small space between them, which looks good, but I would expect there will be an option at some point to remove that blank space. There will also be a dedicated UI that lets you create more tiles by splitting one horizontally or vertically, deleting a tile or adding a floating tile, which should let you mix and match tiled and non-tiled windows. The goal isn't to have something as powerful as i3 or other tiling window managers, but to have at least a solid mechanism to enable users to have more advanced layouts, complete with scripting capabilities so extensions can take advantage of it. They might even add per virtual desktop and per activity tiling in the future, which is really, really good. This should land in Plasma 5.27, so you shouldn't have too long to wait to use it. And my ultra wide is very, very pleased about this. Looks like open source software has finally made it, as scammers are now using ads for GIMP to try and get people to install malware on their computers. Using Google Ads, they launched a campaign that pretends to let you install GIMP, 
but instead redirects you to a copy of the official website hosted at gilimp.com with a malicious download for Windows in the form of an .exe file that has been artificially inflated to use 700 megabytes instead of 5. The main issue here seems to be that the URL displayed in the ad is actually gimp.org, not gilimp.org, so it looks legit. Technically, you cannot display a URL that isn't on the same domain as the real one in a Google ad, but it looks like the scammers found a way to bypass that. The malware itself is a trojan called Vidar, which downloads a DLL from a Russian server, which then downloads a zip archive containing other DLLs used to steal credentials and information, like passwords, browser history, cookies, crypto wallets, telegram credentials, some files, email app information, and more. If you're using Windows, be careful with these ads. It's very, very rare that an open source project will buy AdWords ads to advertise their software on Google search. So always use the natural official site to download the binaries you need. And if you're on Linux, you shouldn't be affected, but do be careful. It could happen with app images or specific packages that have been infected if you don't download them from the right source. Ubuntu-based distros are a dime a dozen, but this one might just take the cake. It's called Vanilla OS, and while it's basically Ubuntu with Vanilla GNOME, it's also much, much more than that. Not only will you get stock GNOME instead of the very tweaked version Ubuntu uses, but you will also get to choose and enable Flatpak, Snap, and app image support at install to get all the packaging formats you want. It also uses a new package manager, APX, that lets you install packages inside a container, and it has on-demand immutability, meaning that you can make the system read-only as you want, so you can prevent applications from making changes to the system. It currently uses the Calamares installer, but they will replace it with their own in the future. Vanilla OS will follow Ubuntu's release schedule with two versions per year, and will have its first stable release in November. Now, it does look like a very interesting distro that actually adds something on top of the Ubuntu base, because stock GNOME, without all the version mismatches and weird things Ubuntu does, a containerized package manager, and all the packaging formats that you might want, plus on-demand immutability, it all paints a pretty cool picture. Maybe I'll give it a shot on the channel. As the KDE team looks towards Plasma 6, with many UI improvements, they're still working on the current version of Plasma. This week, they added the ability to revert Dolphin's list view behavior of clicking on empty space in a row. Discover also got a new homepage with categories that show popular applications, especially KDE ones. These categories are dynamically updated and should finally ensure that Discover lives up to its name. Middle-clicking the network icon will now toggle airplane mode, and Dolphin's path bar will now show hidden folders if hidden files are visible. Other smaller changes include fixing the portal dialogues under the X11 session, a new thin outline around Windows using the Breeze theme, something that should make KDE's dark mode more legible when windows are overlapping, and floating panels will now stop floating when a window touches them, and the padding around elements in that defloated mode are now thinner and should look better. And also, all list views in KDE now have a way better looking style for section headers, especially visible in the system settings. These are some very nice visual improvements, and I cannot wait to see what the KDE team has in store for Plasma 6. Apparently, there won't be any major architectural changes, but more polish, UI, and I'm expecting also a lot more consistency between applications, which is what KDE needs, basically. Looks like GNOME's quick settings in GNOME 43 made extension developers quite happy, and that new menu can now be tweaked a lot. You could already improve the Bluetooth toggle, adding a list of the devices you previously paired with your computer, but now there's a lot more you can do. First, with Quick Settings Button Remover, you can actually remove buttons from the Quick Settings, so you can unclutter that space by deciding to not show performance modes, dark mode, nightlight, or others. And now you can turn that small menu into a full-on panel with a media controller, notifications, per-app audio sliders, and more. This transforms the Quick Settings menu into a full-on panel that can either look integrated with all controls in the same floating card, or separated macOS style with each module floating under the other. And it also works with Dash to Panel to let you place notifications on top of the Quick Settings menu. 
You can install all these extensions from Extension Manager, the best app you can use to manage GNOME extensions. This small extension basically takes all the elements that lived in the date and time panel and move them to a more sensible place, which is a global system menu. Now, if they could add world clocks and weather and calendar events, I would be very, very happy. I talked last week about a critical bug in OpenSSL that delayed the release of Fedora 37. Well, here it is. It was what people dubbed Heartbleed 2.0, in reference to the previous enormous bug that made millions of devices vulnerable. Fortunately, this issue doesn't seem as bad as the real Heartbleed. It still affects every OpenSSL 3 installation, but the update is already available to fix it in OpenSSL 3.0.7. Instead of being a critical level vulnerability, it's only high level. The issue was that a malicious email address verified in a certificate could overflow bytes and either crash the system or allow remote code execution. This vulnerability mostly affects clients like VPNs or Node.js and not servers, which is why it shouldn't cause as many problems as Heartbleed. And some distros even had no problems at all. There's a list of vulnerable software that you can check out if you want to see if your systems need to be patched urgently. Although you should absolutely apply the patch to OpenSSL as soon as it's available if you make use of it. It's just common sense. Okay, let's move on to the gaming news. First, we have One X Player gearing up to make SteamOS an option on their handheld devices. They sent a patch for the Linux kernel to let it handle the fan controller on AMD boards. Gamepad support was already sent in in October, so their latest One X Player Mini Pro should be able to use SteamOS as soon as it's publicly available to other devices. Next, we have a Wine update, version 7.20. It updates the Mono engine to version 7.4, letting you run .NET applications. Font linking was also improved, and 29 bugs were fixed, including for games like Crisis 2, Autonauts, Axiom Verge 2, and more. If you're an Xbox Cloud user, you'll be happy to know that Microsoft finally has improved the quality and resolution of the service on Linux, and by extension the Steam Deck. It should work out of the box on any Chromium-based browser, and you should now have a much smoother streaming experience with higher resolutions available. And finally, we have Linux's market share rising again, at least on Steam. It's now at 1.28% and still growing. Now, it's still half of macOS's share though, so it's not huge by any means. SteamOS is now clearly the biggest distro for Linux Steam users at almost 25%, with Ubuntu a distant second at 12% and Arch at 9%. This time, it's all good news, with more devices priming to support SteamOS and cloud gaming services better supporting Linux. It's a great time to be a Linux gamer. Just like it's a great time to grab a device from today's sponsor. Tuxedo makes devices with Linux out of the box. They ship worldwide and they're based in Germany. And you should probably prefer buying a device from a Linux manufacturer rather than anything of the internet from any other manufacturer that ships with Windows because it basically removes all the guesswork. When you buy a device from Tuxedo, you know that it is compatible with Linux. Whatever the distro you slap on it, it's gonna run and work. And if there are a few tweaks needed here and there, you've got repos that you can add to your distro to make sure that the support is 100% perfect. Plus, they have a wide range of devices that should satisfy every need and every price point. Whether you need a small Ultrabook or a giant workstation or gaming laptop, they have everything with multiple options, the ability to set a custom keyboard layout laser etched on the actual physical keyboard or your own logo on the lid of your laptop. So if you need a new device, do support Linux's development and do support Linux manufacturers by a device from Tuxedo. They're really, really good. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't like it, well, you can also click that dislike button. It still kind of works. And if you really like what I do, you can also support the channel by clicking the super thanks button underneath the video, the PayPal link in the description, or you can join my Patreon members or YouTube members. Both of these get access to an exclusive weekly podcast every Monday where I discuss Linux, open source, technology, the channel, my personal life, and a lot of other things. And you can also get the right to vote on the next topics that I'll cover for the month that comes after. So if you're interested, both links are in the description below as well. So thanks everyone for watching, and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!